they do. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to everyone here in Marrakesh and to those online, welcome. And welcome to Marrakesh. I don't know if you've had a chance to explore or not. Uh, probably not yet. <laughs> Just got in from flights, etc. So thanks very much for attending this. They've, and let me start with a couple of thanks. Well, firstly, I'm Warren Feek. They've asked me to to facilitate this this meeting online and in person. And thanks, firstly, to Tommy and his team for being the driving force behind it. Um, um, particular mention, I think, to Alize, who unfortunately can't be here, who's Moroccan has been supporting the whole process and before her, Audrey, who's now with Vincent, of course. So, so Vincent's team. So there's been a group of people that have been doing this and, and our thanks to them for all the energy, time and skill that they've put into it. Um, just a reminder of the focus, uh, you know, polio's uh, learned a hell of a lot, <laughs> particularly in polio and social change, behavior change, community engagement, communication for development, there is a lot that's been learned. And we felt this was an opportunity to distill some of this learning for two clear purposes. First is, it's not eradicated yet. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> and the, the often the last bit of the eradication process is going to be the most difficult. So what have we learned that can help accelerate the eradication process? And secondly, as we're all part of a broader group of people engaged in international development, what have we learned in polio that could be of value to people working on other issues, gender, uh, rights, uh, climate change? I won't go through all the lists of issues, you'll be glad to know. So there are these two clear purposes to this event. Um, we've asked each of the presenters, and you'll see them up here soon, to please uh, keep to just 15 minutes and have given them a kind of format to do that. And our thanks from the organizers for all of the presenters who put effort into keeping to that format uh, in order that um, we can keep it to 15 minutes each and we can maximize time for discussion and dialogue. Uh, I will try also, as I facilitate this, to interact with the people who are online. Uh, feel free to prompt me if you're online and I'm not paying you attention. Um, as well as the people who are obviously in the room. And just on questions, if you can keep them as short as possible when we come to them, that would be great, and address them to particular presenters. So thanks. We'll, we'll, I'll try to keep this train moving on its tracks. There's an awful lot um, to get through. Um, for introductions, I don't think we'll do introductions for people in the room, but for those who are online, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, just so others know uh, who's engaged in this. Um, I wanted to now ask to, to open this and make some introductory remarks. Dr. Mozem from UNICEF New York and the polio, uh, the deputy director of the polio, uh, polio team and polio eradication team in UNICEF New York. And Dr. Mozem, we would be honored if you would make some introductory remarks, please. Can I use this one? Yeah, you can, I think. Can I stand up and talk? Absolutely. That's that's what Tommy told me. <laughs> and, you know, in UNICEF, you listen what the SBSC colleagues tell you. Uh, good morning. Assalamu alaikum. It's a privilege and honor for me to address this August gathering, in particular when we have around 27, 28 experts. And if somebody knows the least about SBCC, that's me. So, so in this case, uh, it's a pleasure, but um, since I will not go through the written speech, I will just want to make some anecdotal comments from my experience. It has been 30 years I have been in public health. And my first job that I started was community-oriented development project. And I was a medical doctor. I was sent to a village, and the objective of that project was to listen to the community and design interventions. But I have a donor money that was given to design health programs, and community never talked about health as one of their problem. But I have to design a health program, but I have to listen to the community. The biggest task that I started my career to start with. But after two years, I was asked by BMGA 
the British Medical Journal to write an article on community development project because that project became so famous. And that was my hands-on training on SBC, the social behavioral change. Although at that time we used to tell IEC and then we went to C4D and now it's in the air of SBC. These are the three terminology I have seen in my life. So I'm sure Vincent is going to explain that in one of the sessions today. But what I wanted to tell that over 30 years, what I have learned in Save the Children before, ICDDRB in Bangladesh, and then in UNICEF for 20 years, that 60% of all the health programs, the major content is SPC. It's the social and behavioral change, it's the communication, it's convincing the people, listening to them, and building trust. And that's what I tell the biggest challenge that I had in my life, is to have the community trust. And I will come to the end of this polio program, which just for the last two years I'm in polio program. And the country that I have visited most is Pakistan. And the most difficult area, the hardcore refusals, the conversion, when I ask what is the thing that has changed their life, is that the community felt that they were hard. And this is the most difficult because it takes time, it takes energy, it takes continuous effort to get engaged and you don't see visible results when other people will say how many children vaccinated or how many children has got the vaccines, how many doses. These are easy to show. But what changes happen in the community over time? And maybe all changes happen, but the last, they did not convert into a conversion on a coverage. That's something very difficult to achieve. And I think that's what I call the SPSCC colleagues, the behavioral change communication experts, that they give their effort into the program. And I call this infusing life into the battle. That you don't see what artillery in a military is working. We only see the infantry, they are making the victory flags, but somebody else is also infusing the life in the battle. And that's the reason I think today's session is so important. Although, it's around 52 people registered. We are already 30 here, but quality matters, not always the quantity. So that's what yesterday when I was campaigning uh, at the registration to bring more people. But I think if this 30 or 40, we are here, we are convinced and committed, we take this mes message across, that will be the actually the outcome and the achievement of this. Coming to polio and routine immunization, this is another battle. I have done 20 years of routine immunization, and now I'm doing last two years polio. When I was in routine immunization, I had always battled with polio that they're not giving us the time. And now when I'm in polio, I'm telling that since you didn't do your job well, I, we have to do polio because why the routine immunization coverage is so low. And there I give one message that I learned that polio has done communication so well, so well that they are one of the stars in the world. And routine immunization has not done that so well. Although that one is tough, polio is a more or less vertical program. We have a big army to do it, but we need to take the lessons learned from polio and utilize into routine immunization or else the gains in polio is not going to sustain. It will all take an away. And when we take the lessons, we take the failures and we take the success. We always tell people about the success, wonderfully what we have done. We don't tell what we did not do so well. I hope in today's deliberations, we will get both. We also should tell what we did not do well, what we failed, because there was a small lesson in the very early childhood is failure is the pillar of success. We don't want to fail too much, but we had some failure that we should also document and tell to people. With that, I wanted to really thank you all for coming to this session and wish you all the best of luck and have a good day today. This is the beginning. Don't lose all your energy in today's session. You have five more days to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mozem. Um, as you, you'll be aware, there's been a shift going on in UNICEF, and Dr. Mose mentioned it, um, and a, a renaming of this field of work away from communication to, for development and on to social and behavior change. And we thought it was appropriate to have Vincent here to, to give us some orientation as to what that shift is, uh, why it's taking place, and what the implications may be for your work. So, Vincent, over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, talking about energy, I just want to give a full disclaimer that I'm not feeling so great today. Uh, so I'm, I'm not contagious. I'm keeping the mask, but I'm just for everybody's reassurance. Uh, so if I don't communicate that much energy compared to what I usually do, please accept my apologies. Um, oh, I lost the presentation on the screen. 
Can I get it back? Thanks. Yeah, so as um, I'm going to try and explain that name change and hopefully you know, show that it's not uh, a name change that we're talking about, but that the change of name embodies something. Thank you, it's back. The change of name embodies something that actually has to do with improving the quality of what we do. And we've been working at it pretty hard for the past uh, two, three years. There are a few people here in the room, like Julianne, uh, who's been on my team helping with that, with that shift as well. Uh, we've obviously uh, learned lessons from polio. Um, there are two limitations that we try to um, address when we design the shift. The first one is that um, I think we've been overly focusing on the individual level of change. Um, you know, we've been trying basically, you see here, mind and environment. We've been trying to get people to change by influencing their minds. We've been trying to change the people uh, for a long time. Uh, we've been trying on increasing their awareness, changing their risk perception, uh, changing their beliefs, uh, you know, making them fear the virus, making them understand things. Uh, when in reality, um, this is a very rational approach uh, and behavior are much more complex than that. Uh, when people make decisions, they don't only make decisions based on what they think, they make decisions based on their environment. So they make decisions based on what they have access to, what, what the people around them do, what their family wants them to do, you know, how far uh, social, uh, health center is, uh, how easy a vaccine is to get. Uh, so we've seen that very clearly with immunization, for example. And we've studied the drivers of immunization. Um, we always asked to work on ex hesitancy, you know, awareness, side effects. Uh, which are important, they definitely are, but when you really study the drivers of immunization, you see that a lot of people talk about how far away the health center is, you know, how difficult it is to get the vaccine, that they have to work during vaccination hours, uh, that maybe the service provider is not from the right ethnicity, from the right religion, uh, that it costs money, that, you know, so there are a lot of things that have to do with um, the environment and not necessarily people. Uh, we see the same in many areas of UNICEF. Uh, we work a lot on violence, violence against children, violence against women. You know, these violent behaviors, when we study them, they really don't necessarily have to do with uh, knowledge or awareness of people that violence is bad or violence is good. Uh, they often have to do with how the external environment influences them, including the, you know, the stress and the hardship and the, the financial struggles that they face uh, that lead to behaviors that are more violent than they should. Uh, it also links with the social environment and the, the pressure that they receive uh, about how people expect them to be to behave as a father, as a husband, as a you know as a man in the community. So that's the first limitation we try to address. The reason I'm mentioning that is that the way we try to influence the mind is communication. Right? Mostly by by having this approach of we're going to try and change what people think, we have to communicate with them, and we do. But it's not enough. You know, if if we just do that. That's not enough. There are so many influences that come from the outside that we really do need to make sure that the entire environment, whether it is social, structural, you know, cultural, uh, in terms of access to services, is also aligned with what we say so that people can facilitate that change. The second limitation that we've tried to address is that um, we don't give enough of a role for communities um, to, to play in the decisions that affect their lives. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, um, I'll take the example of the uh, uh, pandemic, for example. You know, in the pandemic, we've seen uh, measures that have been taken that, without consulting people that are not based on the reality of people, and so that they are very hard to uh, put in place. So, the, you know, we've seen distancing measures uh, for people who live in very overcrowded environments, uh, where obviously, you know, maintaining the distance is not is not possible. We've seen services and vaccine put in place uh, that were pretty difficult to access uh, for the people. We've seen uh, st um, stay at home measures for those who need to get out to make the one, two, three dollars they make a day to survive. Uh, so you know, there is this issue of, of disconnect between the reality of people's life because they don't have a say in the design at the very initial stage of when we design policies, services or products. Um, the same could be said about the health sector more in general. We've seen in many places some uh, community engagement being taken as a, as a token, right? So the, the tokenism aspect, uh, instead of having a real participation in designing the national policy, in designing the on, at the local level where services are going to be delivered, how they're going to be delivered, who are they going to be delivered to, by who, uh, you know, we have a, a different approach that is a tick the box to, uh, to community engagement. So these are the two limitations we've been trying to address in, in SBC. That's why we, we you know, we encapsulated that in the name. 
the two main pillars of this vision relate to that. Um, it's community-led approach. So we, we are doubling down on engagement, on participation, on accountability mechanism, just to make sure, as I said, that policies, services, products are in line with the daily realities of communities, with their cultural uh, background, with their needs, and, and with all of that. The second is um, social and behavioral science. Uh, you know, with more data, more insights, more analysis, uh, and that helps us uh, understand behaviors, understand why people do something or what they don't. Uh, select the intervention, test the intervention, track the results. Uh, we've really not been good enough at that. Uh, and this is the key to programmatic decisions. You know, we, we cannot be led by assumptions. We cannot be led by what we're used to be doing. We need to have a rational approach using the data, deciding what we do. At the end of the day, this is how we decide on investments, right? We have limited money. I mean, some would argue that polio has more money than others, but uh, I would. I was in polio before, so I can. Um, but, uh, you know, still, nonetheless, you know, we can't throw the money uh, out of the window, right? So we, we have we have an account. And, and both of these things actually have to do with the accountability to the people we serve, right? In both cases, this is for us to do better. Um, quickly, what that means in terms of the programming territories, uh, communication is still uh, absolutely central to what we do. This is our core tool. Uh, we've been doing it for a while. We sometimes need to do it better, but the communication remains at the core. Community engagement, obviously, with everything that I've said, you understand that there are certain st standards to be applied to community engagement, right? I'm not talking about tokenism here. I'm talking about like real community participation. Applied social and behavioral sciences, I just discussed that. What I call here supply side SBC, is is what I mentioned before about us coming in earlier in the cycle to influence the way we work on these uh, systems. How is the sectoral system strengthening is happening? It has to happen with us. Uh, demand is seen as a fix for poorly designed supply at the moment. People design a program, they design a sector, and then they come to us and they're like, "Oh, please build demand." That's not the way it should work. Like that's not demand is built within the supply. Like if you if you open a restaurant and nobody comes in, you, you you don't blame the customers, right? I mean, you need to you need to work on what you have to offer, right? So that's that's what I call the supply side SBC. We are coming in a bit late. Um, I hope it's not too small. If I'll talk you through it anyway. That's the I want to show you how that plays around on the program cycle, like what we're supposed to be doing very concretely. Uh, this is the UNICEF cycle, but you know it's from evidence to design to implementation to monitoring. I think it's just it's just a normal cycle. Um, at the beginning is what I just discussed about this this social analysis, this behavioral analysis. Why do people what they do? Why don't they? You know how is the leaders influencing that? How is being a woman having an impact on what they do? And this should lead. Uh, I never know where to point that thing. Uh, this should lead to defining the social and behavioral results. This is absolutely critical because if your results are just the prevalence of behaviors, that's not good enough. If your result is how many people get vaccinated or how many people uh, slap their children or how many people wash their hands, you're missing the point. Uh, there are so many things that need to change before people do something else. So you're, you're basically setting expectation at the level that doesn't allow you to open that black box in the middle. You know, people might need social support, they might need more money, they might need more skills, they might need more awareness. And, and we set the results at the level that's way too high. It's because we don't unpack the behaviors. We don't understand them well enough. So once you unpack them, you can actually find these root causes, find these reasons and set them as your results more than the prevalence. Um, that's the basis for better coordination with sectors, by the way. That's also the basis for a better relationship with donors. You, know, that you can set results that are easier to achieve uh, with the time frame that we have in the planning cycle, in the funding cycles. Uh, all this evidence should be used for uh, behaviorally informed design, of course. Behaviorally informed design is more than that. There is also a field of science that studies how people make decisions, right? But uh, the influence of certain incentives, certain cognitive biases, we can apply that to what we do. Uh, but importantly, we can also do human-centered design. So work, you know, we can do user journeys, we can work with the with the, uh, the population that participate in our program. We can work with the communities. We need to involve them. And overall, I would say find community led solutions Like people know better than we do. It's, they know what works in their context because they live there. That's their context. And, and actually, you can find similar communities where you have 
people who have already found solutions to the problems that you're trying to solve, right? So some people would call them positive deviants in certain contexts, but uh, or early adopters, or you want to call them the way you want. There are solutions in communities, and people are better to design these solutions. What I want to say at this stage is that this entire left side of the cycle is where uh, we really need to increase our influence. You know, so far we've been seen as people who come after all of that. We've been seen as people who come at the implementation stage to to help with the implementation. Now, what we need to do is help with this entire part of the design. Um, then, of course, we still need to implement. Here you can see, I mean, engagement, mobilization, communication, uh, communication is what we own, right? That That's what we are primarily accountable for. Uh, we've been doing that. We need to keep on doing that. That's our contribution to the uh, interventions. Uh, the other ones that you see, system, policy, services, that's where people feel a bit more comfortable, uh, uncomfortable when I put that under the umbrella of SBC. But in that case, what that means is that everything that's to the left, all of this data, community engagement, just feed it into those who are in charge. We're not in charge of, of strengthening health systems. We're not in charge of designing health policies. You know, we are SBC people, but we have a wealth of evidence. We have, we have, if we've done our job well, we have evidence, we have knowledge of communities, we have engagement mechanism that can help with accountability. Just let's just feed that into that part of the programming just to try and help make it better. Um, experimenting and testing, we've been we've been really bad at that. I've been really bad at that throughout my career. Um, you know, it's, we always are obsessed with designing for scale. I don't know why. It's always you know, it's a UNICEF program as well. It has to be big from the start. That's not the way it works. You know, usually it's fail small, fail fail early, fail rapidly. Uh, that's how good programs are designed. We've, we are trying to do more of that now. Uh, some people in the room are better than me at that, but collectively, I think we can definitely improve. Um, and then throughout monitoring, there is the classic monitoring, but there is also obviously the social, the, the hearing back from the people we're, we're serving. Social listening has made tremendous improvement during the COVID pandemic. Uh, let's not let that slip away. Like we've been, we've been investing so much in system, in understanding, in tracking, and that's beautiful. I'm, I'm not so sure that we've been fully. Uh, you know, walking it all the way to influencing the how uh, policies are made, you know, how uh, the interagency mechanisms operate, but the social listening mechanisms are way in place. Uh, and we've been doing better at feedback and accountability as well. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to interest you, actually. Um, I just keep that. That's, I, was, I wanted to say that, uh, I mean, in a minute, we've been trying to implement that vision in UNICEF for a couple of years in a way that we've tried to make uh, systemic. So, you know, we've worked on our strategic plan, we've worked on sectoral strategies, we've worked on new governance mechanisms, we have a new program guidance, um, uh, sbcguidance.org, if you want to take a look. Um, we have, uh, you know, community engagement in humanitarian action guidance. So we, we've done a lot of things. We have new job descriptions. So I'll, I'll, those who are interested, come to me. That's not specifically relevant to polio, but just understand that we've been trying to run a corporate change process so that our field of work and the hundreds of staff that we have with SBC in their titles actually are better equipped to deliver on the vision that I tried to explain before. Uh, now, how is that relevant to polio? Um, uh, why is it important? What, what does it mean? Uh, well, polio is at the last mile, right? So <laughs> what that means is that you're, you have the hardest part of the job in front of you. Not that everything before wasn't hard. You know, I, I studied polio in DRC. It, it wasn't a piece of cake at the time. You know, polio in Nigeria, some of us were there. It wasn't a piece of cake either. Uh, but the last mile is the last mile is the hardest. And that's when you need excellence the most. Like more than ever, you need program excellence. You, you need program quality. You, you, that's, that's the only way you're going you're gonna to finish the job. Uh, luckily, you're already ahead of the pack. Uh, I have to say, I've, I've been exposed recently to some of the things done in the endemic countries. I was really impressed with the level of granularity of the community engagement. I was really impressed by the level of sophistication of the data that people are looking at. Um, yeah, I struggled to advise how to do better when I was presented to the programs because it's so much than we do in, in certain development uh, programs in other contexts. I'm not so sure about the outbreaks and I don't know them, so maybe you can do better in the outbreak countries. But in the endemic, you are clearly ahead of the pack. There's probably more to be done, but um, just to say, to just fully recognize that. Um, I think the polio strategy is also uh, already fully aligned with the vision that I designed. Uh, you know, it's it's not about communicating with people to influencing them right now. 
it's about influencing the drivers of vaccine acceptance, whatever they are, whatever it costs, right? I mean, people need to accept that vaccine so that the virus is eradicated. Um, and for that, as I said, you need better social data, you need behavioral data, you need better tracking and analysis. You need to be more open to solutions that this data is pointing you to, even if the solution is not in the realm of the things that you're used to do on a daily basis, as you know, in, in, in the way we've been operating so far. So there's this, this uh, openness to you know, what is really the analysis telling you, even if it's uncomfortable. Uh, and that might need also mean to shift the power uh, more to the communities and shift the operations themselves. Like I'm talking about program delivery to the communities themselves as well, if that's one of the solutions, right? So, so maybe even leading to models that are really not the ones we've been using to operate so far. Um, how does the the shift itself to SBC support polio? Well, I, you know, in a way, all of the resources that we developed that I didn't spend time explaining uh, fully aligned with that vision, so they, they should uh, serve you and serve all of the SBC staff that are working for polio. Um, I think we're also creating a more supportive environment for that type of quality SBC. We've been you know, hammering these messages with, with managers, with technical staffs, with partners, um, as we advocate with the leaders and trying to really create appetite for change, for doing things differently, for being uncompromising with quality. And I think you know that's that's what the program needs, obviously. Um, and finally, we've been also positioning SBC in certain agendas that are going to be very important for the eradication. I'll just mention the spoiler. I'm going to talk about trust. I'll just mention the. It's too small for you to read, but that's the that's the way UNICEF is conceiving its primary healthcare agenda now. And at the bottom, you see four pillars: advocate, uh, policies, service, and empower communities. That empower community positioning to the right says uh, it's it's about trust, it's about accountability, it's it's really away from tokenism. And we've been working pretty hard to make sure that the PhD agenda, which by the way is now called the zero dose agenda, as a zero dose being a proxy for multiple health deprivation, uh, we've realized that zero dose communities also don't have access to water, they don't have their daughter going to school, so you know there's this this appetite. Um, SBC is going to be very well positioned in there. Um, so we, you will have SBC people supporting this agenda that will uh, eventually support the polio eradication as well, given the you know routinization being part of it. Uh, I could say the same thing about the uh, public health emergency agenda. I'll finish. Oh. I'll finish talking about trust. Um, We've been focusing, uh, Dr. Mohazem, I think, mentioned trust in his opening. I mean, we've been focusing on trust for a long time. I was in the basement of UNICEF uh, three weeks ago with the polio folks, and I showed them a publication that uh, I wrote with um, Shireen Girgis at the time and Mike Coleman uh, that was for the Independent Monitoring Board and was titled just Trust. That was just the only title. Uh, we're talking 10 years ago, I think. Um, I think it's more relevant than ever. Um, I've, I've told them that I would argue that trust is the most valuable currency that we have right now in in, in development in humanitarian uh, industry. Um, it's going to make or break, and in the political space in general, and in the social space in general, it's going to make or break anything we're trying to do. Um, I think the pandemic has shed some light on that very uh, clearly. and. Um, I'm going to just mention a few things. The Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, as early as July 2020, uh, the GPMB uh, put out that report, you know, focusing on trust and saying that trust uh, would be key in the pandemic. And then we started seeing the uh, high level, high credibility scientific publications coming in early in 2021. Uh, that's Nature Medicine already saying that uh, where social trust is low, COVID behaviors are rejected. Uh, and that was linked to how much government was seen to be trustworthy. That's very early in the pandemic. Uh, just a few months later in PubMed, um, again, that government trust was significantly associated with health and pro-social behavior. So, you know, mask and, co and vaccination and all of that. And that government trust was, uh, you know, organization, fairness, clarity of the communication. Uh, and it kept on going. The most important one was uh, February this year, the Lancet published that a mind-blowing study in 177 countries where they eventually concluded that the number one predictor of uh, transmission was trust. 
Like they looked at multiple variables related to health capacity preparedness, and they concluded that the trust, both the trust in the government and the horizontal trust in society, was the most closely associated with the 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 you know how intense the transmission was in a country. Just let that sink in for a minute. You know, in, in terms of what that means for our operations uh, and for what we need to do for preparedness, uh, you can t take a look at this study in the Lancet. Um, and then finally, there was the Lancet Commission, which is like the high level panel that led the conclusion on COVID. Um, and I'm gonna, not going to read through that, but they basically reached the same conclusion. The reason I am and not thanking you yet, but yeah. the reason I am uh, <laughs> saying that is that I know you're going to discuss misinformation. Um, don't lose track of the root causes of misinformation. I mean, technical solutions, the tactical solutions for um, uh, tracking, preventing, managing rumors are great and they're important, but uh, misinformation is often just a symptom of uh, systems that have failed to uh, support or deliver particular, particular groups of people. That's that's the way it is. Uh, so, you know, we need to deal with these symptoms because they are part of the daily operation. But let's not focus that uh, this misinformation absolutely roots in mistrust. Um, and that might not be necessarily just your job to do. I understand that. Um, but the solution lies in, in governance. The solution lies in, in participation, in working with the communities and putting them at the center. Anyway, thank you. Um, please keep embodying excellence because that's what you've been doing. Please keep on showing what SBC can do. Uh, that's going to be a great contribution for and a great service that you will be doing to the field uh, as a whole. So thank you so much. Vincent, oh, is this working? Yeah. Yeah, I need to. Oh, okay. Um, thanks, Vincent and Dr. Mosem again. Thank you. Questions? What's prompted here? Please. Actually, you're asking a question. Could we just say your name and where you're from, and that would be great. And we need to give you a mic, I think. Tommy, you're the mic man. Yep. Thank you. The mic, by the way, is for the um, is for the people online, obviously. Thank Hi. you. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, very insightful. I'm Ria Orca from USAID Philippines, from the Democracy Governance Team. My question is to the last speaker from UNICEF. Um, you mentioned about the effort to integrate behavior science in your, you know, in UNICEF's sophisticated program cycle system. How would you track the effectiveness of uh, behavior science as you infuse it in your program cycle? So that it's attributable to that strategy. Meaning to say, if a program is successful, it's because of that behavior science um, intervention, and not because it's a successful program, because we did gender and social inclusion better, you know, or um, we did uh, conflict sensitive programming, or we just chose, you know, um, um, the best uh, solutions for that development problem. How would you attribute? the success of that integration approach to, to your system. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to take three questions and then we'll we'll come back and so we'll combine them together. I could take 30 questions by the looks of it. Sue. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Sue Goldstein from South Africa. Um, pure, lovely presentation. Thank you both. Um, I really identified with both of them. The question I have for you, Vincent, is um, two questions. The one is, it's it's great that community-led interventions are going to happen, but with, as you say, there's limited money, except perhaps in polio, but even in polio, there, actually there is a huge limitation. How does one prioritize? Um, and I've never seen within the polio program any look at cost effectiveness of, of any of the programs, which um, in my new job, I'm working in an economics unit and I've just found that absolutely fascinating that we don't actually look at cost and cost effectiveness or cost benefit or cost utility. So I think that's the one question. I think the second question I have is, yes, trust is very, very important. But what do you do when the government is not trustworthy? I mean, you know, I come from South Africa. We, the government is not trustworthy. But we still want to protect people from getting COVID or 
polio or have their have their immunization. So I think that there has to be something else as well. Thanks. Thanks. And I'll take, oh, by the way, Sue's also a member of the Polio Independent Monitoring Board, so she has some knowledge of what's going on here as well. I'll take one more. Yeah, sure. Tommy, your choice. I don't know. Oh, that doesn't help, Tommy. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll be very brief and uh, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. So I was just wondering, since we have been discussing about the name changes over time for the same thing. So in your presentation, you have said about the human centered design, but earlier we used to have participatory approaches. Is it fundamentally different? This is the first question. And second question is that for the government and programs, how much we really spend time on developing human centered design? But otherwise, government uh, works at scale. If they don't adapt it, then probably the other development partners might not really influence. Thank you. Mm. Vincent, did you want to pick some up? And did you have any responses to these, Dr. Mozim, as well? But I'll start with Vincent. Sure. Thank you. OK, thanks uh, for easy questions as usual. Um, right, first question about um, behavioral science and the impression that I gave that if, if a program is successful, it's because it's been uh, attributed to behavioral science. So thank you for sending me back to the drawing board on my slides, because uh, that's the, I didn't want to communicate that impression. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, conflict sensitive programming and the uh, fully agree. These are all needed. I think the only thing I, I took it from my narrow perspective of trying to promote more behavioral science. The only thing I was trying to say is that, uh, you know, I've been with UNICEF for a little, a little more than a decade now. Um, I've seen so many programs where people do something to address a behavior. And when I ask them why, they don't have an answer. Like when I, when I say, why do you do this communication campaign on violence against children? They're like, well, because, you know, to make people aware that it's bad. And I'm like, are they not aware? And they, said, yeah, they don't know. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because I'm, I'm also often very surprised when we do some good quality formative research. Uh, and we've done a lot these days. We've done good ones on sexual violence in Senegal recently. We've done good ones on child marriage in Ethiopia. The reasons that come up to explain when people explain themselves or trying to explain what they're doing are not the ones we predict. Like we don't. So, I, I, you know, I wasn't trying to make behavioral analysis the sole uh, condition for quality programs, but we need to do a lot more of it for sure. Like, I mean, I've seen, I've seen investment again, just a decade. Some of you have been in programs for longer than that. I've seen investment decisions made on, made on the basis of nothing. Uh, we can get lucky, but we can also try and think a bit better about what we do, especially when we rerun the same thing every year uh, for, for, you know, one year, two year, five year, 10 years, 15 years, and that we see the prevalence of a behavior or the incidence on, of a negative behavior that's not moving at all. And so uh, sorry if I misrepresented that and I'll try to do better. It's a shame because I'm going to reuse the same slide in like one hour. So it's just, <laughs> I don't know if I have time to do that in the bathroom, uh, quickly. Um, so, uh, we have limited money. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we prioritize with limited money? I, it's, I think what I what I was trying to say here is not that we need more money to do what I'm suggesting to do. I, I think it's it's we already invest quite a lot of money in stuff that are not proven to have an effect. Um, maybe there is a little initial increment of money for a bit further more, a bit more research, a bit more, you know, new thinking, new design. But but the money for programs is already there. I mean, including in polio. Uh, I don't know how many campaigns you keep on running in countries every year. Uh, back in the days when I was in, one. No, I don't know. Uh, I don't uh, uh, but, but when I when I was working on polio in Afghanistan, you know, sometimes I was amazed to see we would run 14, 15 rounds in Kandahar between the mop-ups and you know the needs and the you know sort of. It's not that the money wasn't there for activities. I think it's, and I'm not saying I had this, any solution for polio in Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Uh, so, but so taking it out of polio, the, the money, uh, including for the child protection, for example, com completely different for health. We have significant money coming for the FGM program, the child marriage program, the, the gender program from the European Union. The, the, the money is there. 
I think it's more about uh, trying to redirect the money towards something, uh, trying something a bit different. Uh, it is true that cost effectiveness is terrible. Um, we don't have the data. I don't have the data. I we worked with Warren um, and 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 Chris and people from the, uh, the the community recently on trying to do an evidence impact mapping for SBC and those who will get the bag, you will get the little deck of cards like this. Um, that's one of the results where we try to identify what has really proven to have a, a solid statistical impact in terms of SBC practices. And we found quite a lot. I mean, there's a wealth of things that have worked pretty amazingly. None of it has a price tag. Like, and we, you know, we've discussed that, that it's this, there is no study about uh, how much impact and quality costs. Um, and, and interestingly, I guess that's what high level people ask, because I met with our executive director like two months ago and she asked me, does it work? And I say, yeah, it does. It does. I can show you example in health, in, in education, in child protection, in anything that it does. And, it's, and she's like, do, you, do we know how much it costs? And I was like, oh, well, uh, we don't. No, we really don't. Uh, but I do need more money. Um, what do we do when governments are not trustworthy? I don't know. Um, I mean, trust is a perception, so they might not be trustworthy, but perceived as trustworthy. But the, the, I mean, the bottom line is that communities trust themselves. So maybe at the end of the day, that's the level where we need to go. I don't know. I know this. I know how it is difficult in, I mean, places. If I, if I, I'm not wrong. In Pakistan, it's more than not being trustworthy; is being perceived in certain parts as being the enemy. Uh, again, not being in Pakistan, but that's what I hear from the colleagues. So it's it's a bit extreme. Um, what, how is fundamentally how is that fundamentally different? Um, what I would I would let me start by saying something provocative. The way C40 was explained to me uh, 12 years ago when I first joined UNICEF on my induction is not fundamentally different, but that's not the way we implemented it. Um, when I first joined UNICEF, uh, 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 Raphael, uh, was it Raphael? Was it someone? I can't remember. Someone explained to me uh, putting communities at the center. Communication is not one-way communication. It's you know it's really two-way communication. We need to be innovative and all of that. That's not the way I've seen that uh, C4D operate in many cases. Some of us have done that, but I think we've been cornered. In my perception is that we've been cornered by by the the fact that we have been perceived as a Communication means something in UNICEF, and that's not what I just described. Uh, for the sectoral colleagues, at least, that's not the, that's not what they understand. We've been cornered in doing uh, IEC materials uh, for a long time, for a very long time, and we've been asked to come at the last minute at the implementation stage. As I said, for a very long time, people wouldn't come for you know for us to work uh, early in the cycle. So you know, this paradigm shift is also trying to make a clean slate and try and reposition ourselves in providing, yes, partly what we were supposed to be doing before, partly a bit more than that as well. You know, there are elements of the new toolbox that are not necessarily uh, communication related. Um, I think that's it for the question. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I wanted to address the cost effective issue. I think if you ask about the costing of the SBC out of the polio elimination, we can do that. But the cost effectivity is a very difficult term, and I'll explain why. Because I think one of the agenda the UNICEF pursues is the rights of the child and to reach every child. Now, reaching that last child is very, very expensive. If it is in the hard to reach areas, if it is in the hardcore refusal, it was only 30,000 children in Karachi that you were struggling the whole polio reserve. And if we have spent million dollars even, it's not even expensive because that's where the billion dollar polio program was stuck with. So for us, yeah. Uh, so, so, so for that, it's difficult to do the cost effectiveness. Second thing is that what is the impact against which I will measure my cost or the effectiveness? I see in the SPC, a lot of things fall on the, like if I have gone 10 visits to a community and I could not convince the person to get the immunization coverage or the polio drops, now the outcome is still he's not covered, but how do I do the measure the effective? Because I have made ten visits and I had about ten workers going every time. So that's the reason I'm now working with the ME team and the SBC team to get the process indicator that about uh, 
uh, Vincent was telling, that if we can identify, get some of this process indicator and put that in our routine m &E work that I can monitor and I can see the progress, probably at some time we will have some idea. The other challenge I would say in polio, we never had a short of funding until last year. This is the first year when we had less money. So probably Polly was not looking at cost-effective interventions. They were just spending money wherever he wanted. But now we are going there. So Pakistan is starting with looking at the community-based vaccination strategy. That's considered to be very expensive. But what is expensive and what is the outcome? That's the I think, next challenge we are going. So we are getting into that area of looking at more cost-effectiveness to look at money. But I look at the cost effectiveness in another way. In Iraq, we were getting money for SBC for polio SIA, but we were not having serious polio there. So I was using polio SIA money for the routine immunization, all SBC that I have to do. And I consider that as a very effective way if you have innovative way of spending your money. So that's, I would say, it's very difficult to answer, but I think we are conscious of that because continuously we are being reminded to make the best use of the money we have. On the government trust, my understanding, although I'm the youngest probably in the polio here, uh, my understanding is that in the SPC, as Vincent said, there are some areas where the polio particularly and the government is perceived as suspicious program, as agent bringing from outside. I think there we go through the third party neutral agencies and we want to de-link with the government, that's one. But on the other hand, in all other areas, I have seen all the material that we develop is the testing and experiment that UNICEF does, but then it is implemented the modalities through the government workers. And I totally agree with you. If that is not mainstream with the government main workers, we might achieve in one or two places, but we're not going to sustain. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's on this cost effectiveness because I mean, it's it's the thinking applies less to polio, I guess. In I mean, if you look at the marginal cost of the increased uh, child you're going to vaccinate, it's obviously, I mean, the harder it gets, the more underserved the populations are, the higher the head cost is going to be. And the closer you get to zero, you know, this, the, the cost is going to skyrocket anyway. I think I had seen uh, trends like that, uh, including you know, already a few years ago. I also, there is an issue with cost effectiveness, which is we, we measure it and we are going to try and measure it against targets that are SDG targets. Um, there is no uh, cost to doing the right things in, in some cases. And, you know, I'm talking about uh, what is the price for community engagement, uh, community empowerment? What is the price for, uh, you know, trust, building trust? Like none of these things are actually properly measured and they're going to be. So, you know, when I say trust to me is the is the most valued currency at the moment in what we do, I, I strongly believe in that. Um, and we can, you know, explain ways of building trust, but we can't necessarily have a, a price. I mean, cost effectiveness about rebuilding the social capital in a community, how do you measure that? And yet, if you want to prepare for emergencies, you need social capital in these communities so that, you know, they're more resilient to shock. Um, so we're, we still need to do some more cost effectiveness. We're, we're thinking about it with Warren, actually, about how to put price tags to some of these studies. I'm talking to the uh, Office of Research of UNICEF to try and launch more research around that. But I think we shouldn't become obsessed with it because of certain cases when price might not be the you know the, the main driver and some things actually might not have a price. Uh, it's a bit philosophical, sorry. Uh, I hope I made my point anyway. Thanks, folks. Well, I promise to keep this train on the tracks, but we're already delayed. Um, so we're going to have to move on. Um, I want to thank uh, Vincent and Dr. Mosem very much for those introductory remarks. We've said an outstanding context for some of the work that will be described in the future in this event and some of the issues that we will deal with. I'm sure like you, I mean, I've got 10 questions for both of them running through my head, but I'm sure you can grab them at lunch or whatever and, and uh, have that discussion. So thank you very much to the two of you. And if you don't mind leaving up here and I can invite Adnan, Deeper. Ah, sorry. My apologies. Uh, uh, Jahan, Caden, and Ross to to join us up here, please. Yeah. Just uh, I'll go. Thanks. I'll sneak over here so the three of you can have. It. Um, yes. Yep. 
Well, thank you. Uh, oh, no. uh, who are we missing? Caden was going somewhere. He's right. He ran off. Well, he ran off to. <laughs> well, he's first. <laughs> Is this one working? Hi. Um, Caden ran off with us. I don't know where he went. Caden, come back and join us. <laughs> Please have a seat. Yes. Um, one of the one of the things that flows on from the comments you just heard from Vincent and Dr. Mozem is the issue of social data and the utilization of social data and great strides have been made in the, the polio program in, in which social data to collect, how to analyze it and how to incorporate the results of that analysis in the programming. So, sorry, tell me, did we do something wrong? And welcome back. <laughs> so we wanted to run a session quickly on this issue of social data. And this is relevant. Yeah, take a seat there. Um, this is relevant, of course, not just to polio. This is a relevance across all aspects of development action. And so we've asked uh, Jahan to talk about challenge mapping in Pakistan, Kate to talk about the Mozambique response to, to WPV and the CBDPV outbreaks. <laughs> God, I get confused. And um, and Ross to talk on some issues related to quality research and perceptions. So, Jahan, I think you're first. If you just hit the button, you should be on. This is Tesselis from Karachi. So today I will be presenting uh, how we started our challenge mapping and how we collected our social data that uh, ultimately supported uh, to minimize resistance specifically for polio vaccination in Pakistan. So, so this is the process of how we are collecting the challenge mapping. Uh, though like uh, previously Vincent and uh, uh, Mozam also described that we have a lot of campaigns since last 24 years in Pakistan, we are still endemic for polio. We have still cases in South KP and for sure due to uh, frequent movement in between Pakistan and Afghanistan, we can still say that Karachi is a big threat uh, where population movement for international uh, as well. So that virus can still transfer to other areas as well. So back in 2019, when we have a lot of refusals in Karachi, currently we have around 30 to 35,000, but previously back in 2018-19, we have some around 200K plus refusals only in Karachi, and mainly these were from, from priority one areas. From priority one areas specifically, these are the population who belongs to mainly from Pashtun areas. Currently we have South KP, Afghanistan, these, these, are, these are the same belt, and we, and when we further dig out the uh, uh, the reasons of resistance in those specific areas, we came to know that there are severe trust issues between government and these communities, specifically because these were war affected areas in South Waziristan and North Waziristan after war on terror uh, uh, back in 2004 and 5. Uh, these areas were severely bombed by Pakistani army and all those people, and somehow they believe that. Uh, at once they are coming to vaccinate our children and other they are bombing on us because they have severe issues with government and military leadership as well. So what we started back in 2019, we sited with the people, with the specific people. After each campaign, we have the data of those uh, children who are unimmunized. Then we, uh, based on that, that data, we started risk analysis, which are the children who have poor routine immunizations, who are living in slum areas, who have issues with government and that were not vaccinated since last main, many years. So then we sit with those people and started identification of, uh, uh, we did detailed profiling for each and every child. Like we have available all the data sets, including their name, father name, their ethnicity, uh, which tribes they belong, which sex they belong. So all those details which we, we have collected after each and every campaign, basically that 
social data are supporting us to have very specific and targeted SBC intervention with the consultation of communities because these communities hardly believe on the things which came from government, which came from other partner agency. You need to sit with them. You need to listen with them because these are war affected from Afghanistan and South KP and then they were living in Karachi in those slum pockets where other basic facilities are also not available. So that's why they, when, whenever we do any community engagement session in those specific pockets, they were always like sharing their concerns. You are coming only for polio, but my child also need education. My child need also nutrition and other basic services. But we were only going there for eight to 10 campaigns in a year. And we were trying to, 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 to sensitize them that we are, we have concern for your child and we are coming for polio. And it's very important that you get two drops of OPV in every campaign, uh, but they have these concerns. So we did, we did all those profiling. Then we sit with them. We started categorization of those areas where the pockets are, where the numbers of male children are high. Then we further desegregated into, into tribes, sub tribes, and then sect. Then we started identification their real opinion leaders. Who are they? where from they, what are their concerns, then we sit with them. Basically, that was the like, like that was the, the time when they share their concern that what are the issues we have around vaccination. It's not only vaccination. We get some information for vaccination as well, but they also change, uh, uh, also share other ground challenges as well. What are the, the other ISD services they need? Not working yet. So we we did uh, detail uh, deep dive into those challenges and then we started co-created solution with them. We give more ownership to them. We started getting people from their own community who has to work in their specific areas. All those vaccinators, all those social mobilizers we got from the same community. And then we provided with the support of other uh, health sections and nutrition section. We we started some of the ISD services in Gujro 4 and at the Hard Town. And then somehow we started getting trust of those people. They were sharing their real concerns with us. And then they were sharing how we can minimize those resistance. Uh, so uh, along with communities, we started mapping challenges current, and then we started how we can, uh, we can have some solution for some of the important areas where we can minimize the resistance for polio vaccination. And then uh, we give more ownership to the community and then start tracking all the activities with the support of those people. We have segregated all those areas like where we have more than 100 refusals in a specific area. We targeted firstly those areas where we have high number of refusal and then we have started those where we have 70 to 900 refusals and 40 to 50 refusals. Uh, the slide where we can see that we got we get all those details information all those social data we have available like their lingual set certification their re religious who are them in Pashtuns we can specifically like in Pashtun uh, in Pakistan there are three different blocks one one is central KP one is Fata and then we have Koita block these are all Pashtuns even different, they have different cultures, they have different norms. So previously, like we were targeting Pashtun as a once. So all our messages, all our engagement of those political leadership, which were mostly in central KP, but they were not working in those areas where we have communities from Fata and Koita block, and even from some of the block from Afghanistan. Then we started realization that most of our refusals are belong from Mesut tribe, Aka Khel tribe from Afghanistan, and then we have some refusals from uh, from Suleiman Khin and all those pockets from Koita block. Then we started identification of real refusals from those specific real influencers from those specific tribes. Then when we started engaging those tribal leaders, those religious leaders which belong from their sect, those doctors which mostly they believe, those health. Uh, those faith healers which they believe then we started getting some of the results in those specific areas uh, because this was not even happened without getting this social data previously our strategy was what more generalized more focus on messaging 
more focus through media and advocacy. But when we started engaging those people in their specific communities, we started getting results in those pockets. If we look into the results, like in Karachi specifically, we have some around more than 100 areas where we have more than 100 refusals. And then we have areas with orange where we have 70 to 99 refusal. And then we have areas in yellow where we have 40 to 70 refusals. In polio, like epidemiologically, it is important to get around 95% of the coverage is in each area, not in, even in the UC, not even in the city. So you need to make sure that each and every area has to achieve around 95 to 98% so that virus cannot cannot have a space in those specific areas and not can further uh, transfer to any other uh, areas. So if you look into the results currently, like previously back in 2020, we have more than 119 areas where we have uh, more than 100 refusal, but Alhamdulillah, currently we don't have any area where we have more than 100 refusals. Even if you look into the areas, we have hardly few areas in orange and yellow but we are continuously working with the community and hopefully uh, it's not a matter of one campaign. You need to keep those people throughout the year. You need to intact, tech, intact them with the vaccination that they should get OPV drops in each and every campaign. If you look further into the, uh, into the data, though we have around 30,000 still refusals in Karachi, but if we further segregate, we hardly have around six, five to 6,000 refusals who are living in Islam and who are continuously or permanent, uh, persistently refusing for vaccination. Otherwise, somehow in one or two campaigns, some of them are vaccinating and remaining them are excusing that you, you just came 20 to 30 days before and you are coming again and again. So that's the issue uh, like in Pakistan, we are continuously facing, but with the support of ISD services, with the support of additional services provided by the by the, by the UNSF, BM, BMGF, and those integrated messages along with ECD uh, is supporting polio uh, uh, to changing their mind for vaccination. So these are some of the key learnings like community driven SBC intervention for sure will work in, in every area. We have declined around 70% of the refusal in these in those specific areas. Uh, currently in Karachi, we are since 14 months have no virus, despite that we have frequent movement from South KP Afghanistan. Uh, we have we got the virus in, in August 2022. But again, we did a very good uh, case response in those specific pockets with the support of community leaders. And currently in Karachi, we don't have any virus. Currently, only one endemic zone that is South KP, but they have like other issues, security, access issues. Uh, and like we were discussing with Mozam, the same thing, we need to engage those communities on the same pattern because they have severe issues with government. Uh, means with the support of government, we can't, move in those specific areas. But if we engage their specific tribal leaders, their real real religious leaders, for sure we can get access in those areas as well. Because in Karachi, even these Super 8 Irish Union Councils, they have the same structure in Karachi as well. Like we have Taliban hideouts, they have the same population in those areas. But for sure, when we started engaging with communities, we get we got the the female from those specific areas, from Mesut, from Akakhel, then for sure now it's, it's very easy for us to get access in those areas, not only in the area, but inside the house as well. And there is no language barrier in between front, our frontline workers and with the community. Okay, my this. Then uh, basically priority one population, this is Pashtun population are best engaged through their traditional ways and means. And then uh, using social data for all the SBC intervention for surely will work in the future as well. Again, a, a systematic approach for collection of data. It's very important to have real time data uh, because in some of the areas still we are struggling to get actual data around refusals. Uh, without specific data, we cannot have a specific SBC intervention and without engaging specific community or specific community opinion leaders will not get that specific result. So all the messaging, all the media advocacy, all the engagement with the community should be based on some specific social data. 
otherwise it will be very difficult and each and every area required a different interventions so in karachi even we have a very separate uh, uh, okay. sbc intervention okay. in priority and slum areas and then we have totally uh, change SBC intervention in post areas where people are more literate, more educated. They have other issues around uh, refusing for vaccination. And then for course integration of messages is also working. You should not only go with polio specific messages. Uh, you, you can integrate some of other messages specifically around nutrition, wash, education, because those are the areas where uh, people uh, getting the messages and at the end, this will help us to get, uh, to build the trust as well. So People thank you, thank you very message. much. And yes. if anyone have any question, we can discuss. What are the messages? Yeah, we'll, we'll come to the questions later if we can. Thank you very much, Jahan. Uh, let's turn to Ross and then, yep. And then we will, you okay with that mic there? Or do you want this, Ross? Yeah, can I have my... Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Let's see which slides come up. Still don't know. <laughs> we all have the same. Okay, it's you. It Okay. Okay. Who's, who's up? Who's up? Who's up? Okay. It's me. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll stand here and no, I think I'll stand here and speak. I need to see the slide. Uh, so I'll share the experience. I'm Ketan from Mozambique uh, office in UNICEF. Um, um, and I'm going to share some experience of the recent um, experience we had already, uh, uh, yeah, about programming we had around polio. Uh, just as um, context, uh, Mozambique, I think, um, recorded uh, its first wild polio case after almost a 30-year gap uh, earlier this year. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty unique kind of a, uh, circumstance and, and very troubling for the government. I think it were two sub-Saharan African countries, Malawi first and then, um, then uh, Mozambique. Uh, so it's been quite a bit of an uphill battle for the country to, to respond to that. Um, so I guess in terms of data, so uh, we were kind of taken on a on a back foot when suddenly uh, first Malawi discovered the cases and then it was also in Mozambique. Uh, for, uh, we had circulating wild polio virus from last year um, in some of the provinces, but then uh, when we started vaccinating against polio, that's when the wild polio case was discovered. Um, I think it was an eight-year-old girl in Ted province. So we had to kind of quickly mount a response um, the government was um, was doing uh, you know, the routine immunization programs quite well. I think the OPV coverage was about 73% or so uh, at the beginning of 2020. But with COVID, I think overall the routine immunization rates were also going down. Uh, so in terms of the response, as you know, the whole response is, is, is put in place by Global Polio Eradication Program with UNICEF, WHO uh, supporting and Bill and Melinda Gates and the Rotary supporting the government. Uh, so it was a multi-layered social behavior change strategy, uh, which we used uh, as part of reaching and engaging caregivers. Um, we were using both, um, I'll talk about it towards the end of the presentation, but we were using, because of the circulating wild polio virus and uh, circulating vaccine-derived polio virus and the wild polio, we were using two types of vaccines. So we had to kind of cover the, all the 12 provinces uh, and do also certain campaigns which uh, had to be focused in some of the uh, the uh, priority provinces based on the type of the outbreak. Uh, so the uh, IM uh, the data, the information management and the LQS surveys both were used uh, to look at, uh, particularly for the SBC side, uh, looking at knowledge and awareness of all the families before the campaign. So three days pre-campaign, what was happening in terms of mobilizing uh, the families to accept the vaccine as part of the door-to-door, -door, as well as uh, looking at refusals. And the aim was to keep the refusals below 1%, uh, you know, across the communities and ensure that at least more than 95% of the families were aware of the campaign. And I think we were able to achieve more or less all of this, you know, across the six campaigns that we have done so far. Uh, so the data on social inves investigation of the polio cases, uh, you know, pre and post campaign um, was 
used as a foundation for us to ensure that we are able to tailor in certain areas where we were identifying some issues with refusals. Um, so the polio campaign was intense, but it was ensured, you know, we were ensuring that there was continuous dialogue happening. As I said, it was the first time that a wild polio case has been discovered after such a long time. So there were, we were concerned whether there would be questions from the communities. So we were prepared to answer these as part of the social mobilization and the pre-campaign door-to-door uh, uh, preparation of the communities which had to be done. Um, and as much as possible, we were also ensuring that there is enough, you know, human resource capacity, uh, both in terms of SBC expertise, but also in terms of uh, retraining uh, the social mobilizers uh, who were used for the door-to-door -door campaign in terms of the communication skills. Um, so what did we find? I think the main issue was really, you know, focus on data. You know, we wanted to look at trust. It was mentioned in the earlier presentation by Vincent. Uh, I wanted to have, ensure that there is acceptance, uh, the good acceptance of the vaccine. Um, so in Mozambique, broadly speaking, there we don't have challenges when we do, do the routine immunization program. Uh, but because of the fact that uh, polio was coming in as a new, particularly the wild polio virus, as a new um, you know infection back into the country, we were a bit concerned uh, to figure out you know how do we be you know keep ourselves prepared in case there were questions coming from the communities. Also, there were some religious kind of factions where we were again given what was happening in Malawi, we were a bit concerned if there would be similar situations also. Uh, in Mozambique. So we just wanted to be preemptive of those measures. So we engaged the religious leaders uh, across the different provinces, both the, the Muslim and the, relig uh, the, the um, Christian religious leaders, and we ensured that uh, in Mozambique, the widest channel used to reach, particularly in rural areas, are community radios. We have about 120 odd community radios. So we ensured that we were able to work with the community kind of uh, broadcasters to ensure that there were not just spots, but some kind of uh, debates and programs around polio uh, vaccination program. Mobilization of communities in urban areas was a bit challenging um, because of the fact that you know people are mobile, they are also using multiple platforms. So it's not just community uh, or religious leaders and the community radios, but you know in urban areas, including in the provincial kind of said is the, the urban capitals of the, the, the provinces, uh, people are far more mobile, so we needed to come up with uh, different ways of engaging with, uh, with the families over there. Um, and I think um, one of the things which we did late, not the first few rounds, but later on, was to work with the pediatricians, again, mostly in the urban, peri-urban areas, because we wanted to make sure that families are not then rejecting, uh, you know, the multiple rounds of polio doses which were coming in. Uh, effective engagement of high-level leaders, I think this is important. Uh, I guess the communities, as I said, acceptance of the vaccine is relatively um, it's straightforward in Mozambique. We don't have that many challenges and it was tracked by the refusals. And I think I'll speak to it in a minute. It wasn't really about the trust, but we needed to ensure that um, the, uh, you know, outside of Ministry of Health, we wanted to ensure that there were senior um, political kind of uh, governors and uh, the secretary of state. They were, the refusals were not because of any challenges with regards to accepting the vaccine. It was because the family was not home, um, you know, or the, the it was not that the family was actually rejecting the vaccine once again. So we had to go back to that data and ensure that, you know, we are going back and doing some active community listening. Um, communities do have multiple priorities, as we all know, as you know, was also mentioned by Jahan. Uh, so we needed to kind of weave within that uh, the uh, that communities are accepting the door-to-door -door, um, uh, campaign which was taking place. Uh, as I said, most of the time it was about uh, families were not home, they had to go out to work. The timing of the campaign was not necessarily, the door-to-door -door visit wasn't very good. Schooling was another factor. So we needed to take into account these issues um, and ensuring that there was 
kind of a respectable conversation happening, dignified kind of way of, of engaging with the families, even if they were not at home, so that if there's a second round of visit, uh, you're not blaming the families for not being there in the first place. Uh, so I think context and environment in that you know case is also critical rather than just looking at issues of um, uh, of communities. And then routine data on vaccine acceptance layered with an analysis of hesitancy or resistance. So in certain areas, there were some religious challenges, which we immediately, I think, as I said, were uh, addressing that by mobilizing uh, and engaging with the religious leaders and using this data from LQAs and from the IM data sets to ensure that the strategy is a bit uh, nimble and we were able to change it as we went forward. Um, so reflections, uh, as I said, we were using two types of vaccine, the NOPV and the bivalent, uh, but I guess it was a strategic decision was made um, to not necessarily explain the different types of vaccines. It was not really raised by the media and we didn't want to go in and confuse communities in terms of the different types of vaccines. So it was a polio vaccine, it was a polio vaccine. So we were, that was one way of, of, of uh, addressing this issue because initially it was raised um, you know, within the technical working groups, how are we going to communicate uh, the challenges? The same thing was done for COVID when we were using um, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and then initially they were also using, uh, I think, uh, Sinopharm and other vaccines. So, you know, why some people are getting two, why some people are getting one. I think that was a decision based on that uh, experience as well, also for bivalent and, on, and uh, for uh, NOPV. So um, communities were not explained the difference, there were no questions, so we really didn't need to get into any kind of science communication issues here. A vaccine derived and while polio found during surveillance and campaigns also did not pose a threat in terms of people were not questioning, certainly you know, why this disease when we haven't had polio for such a long time. And I think uh, this experience has helped us essentially uncover the gaps in routine immunization. The zero dose cases, I think um, uh, for um, one of the main things that has come out of the polio ex uh, experience is the fact that the denominator uh, was, was, was essentially wrong. So the routine immunization coverage is about 91% uh, in 2020, I think, uh, and it's dropped down to about 67% uh, now. Uh, so it's one of the steepest drops post pandemic, I think after Myanmar, if I'm not wrong, but the main issue is also with regards to the denominator. And I think it's because the census, which is used from 2017 is not accurate. So essentially the number of doses of vaccines that we have in the country are less than the number of eligible children. Uh, so this, this is what was identified during the polio campaign. And that's being used, I think right now to make sure that we are able to address that issue because many times when we do exit interviews at health facilities, uh, there is the complaint is that the fam mothers are bringing the kids, but there is no vaccine or the, the, the health worker is not necessarily aware that the vaccine is there. So it's not again an issue of demand, um, but it's a it's an issue of how family members are being communicated with. Uh, if indeed there's a shortage, then how do you explain that they will come back uh, so that they are not missing? Uh, so these are, I think, some of the challenges that we are facing and I think polio, if there is a positive side to the story is that it's helping us uncover this issue with regards to that the country really needs a better information management system in terms of vaccine stocks and then um, also the number of vaccines that we can have for the eligible uh, children under five. Yeah. Over, thank you. Uh, all right, while we're waiting, ice break, everybody jump up. That's right, we have lunch soon. Lunch is the icebreaker. Um, so I'm just looking at my phone so I can set a timer. I'm not going to dance, no. Um, so just to check, who is in this room who's not working on polio full time? If you could put your hand up. Full time, okay. So there's quite a lot of people who aren't really part of the polio world. Is anyone from Cameroon or from Ethiopia or has lived in either of those places? Mm -hmm. No, no one. Usually there's somebody who's worked in Ethiopia. Everyone seems to go there. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah.
Okay, so uh, I'm Ross. I'm an m and &E specialist in the UNICEF Polio HQ team. Uh, I'm going to present the findings of some research that we did uh, early in 2020. Um, it was a piece of qualitative research which looked um, at perceptions of polio vaccines in the wake of the COVID-19 emergency in uh, Cameroon and Ethiopia. Okay, so um, I'm going to describe the research that we did and why we did it to start off with. Um, so this was what I would call a high quality piece of qualitative research. Obviously in the qual research space, there's essentially two routes that you can go down. You can go down a quick and dirty route where you basically get whoever is around to go and speak to some of the communities and document it in some way or another and quickly try to draw some conclusions. Or you can do everything in a more systematic way where you take time to develop data collection tools, uh, test data collection tools, have some um, well-trained field researchers to go and conduct a field research and then analyze the data systematically. Both have their place, of course. For this particular piece of research, we took the high quality route. Now we did it with FHI 360, and I know there's some FHI 360 people, 360 people here. Uh, so we did it in uh, two sites in Ethiopia, so Addis and Edema, and we did it in two sites in Cameroon, Yaoundé and Bafia. So Addis, Yaoundé, obviously big cities, uh, Adema and uh, Bafia are kind of peri-urban areas, sort of more like, um, more like large or small towns. The reason that we did that is because we thought the stuff that we were looking at was going to be different in the in big urban areas as opposed to smaller urban areas. And we thought that was probably going to be due to the level of smartphone penetration. Uh, interestingly, that assumption was totally incorrect and everybody seems to have internet access everywhere. So clearly need to update our priors. Uh, the reason that we did this work was essentially to understand um, Look, we have polio outbreak responses or had polio outbreak responses in both of these countries. In both Ethiopia and Cameroon, we have polio outbreaks or we had at the time of the research. So we're doing house to house campaigns to try to stop those outbreaks in their, in their tracks. Now, uh, we've been doing polio outbreak response for a really uh, long time and we know how it works. Um, what we think or what we thought and we were right has changed is that um, more or less everyone in the world has gone through the experience of the COVID-19 emergency uh, you know from the immediate things like uh, lockdowns masks uh, sanitizing your hands every five minutes uh, PCR tests to get into events all of that um, from from that to the actual um, the kind of media experience of um, of uh, watching all of this stuff take place and unfold on television. Okay. And we thought that um, as uh, COVID-19 vaccines were being rolled out, uh, we you, thought that you, you all of that. this what together... It's a ghost. Yes, sure. You know what call again? Yeah, can we mute them? Yeah. Okay, let's just plow on with it regardless. Um so we So the community writ large, essentially, and the purpose of doing this was to help us understand, OK, so this isn't representative of the whole world and it's not representative of the whole of Africa, but it gives us a pretty good idea about how this has played out in two countries. And we can try to generalize some lessons from from that, and that will help us strengthen our SBC strategies around uh, polio outbreak response. 
Uh, so to actually present all of the findings from this big piece of research, it takes forever. I only have 15 minutes and there's only about 10 of them left. These are the two main learnings, which you probably can't read at the back. Uh, essentially, Cameroon and Ethiopia were totally 100% different. In Ethiopia, what we saw is that um, uh, prior to COVID-19, there was very little vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and then after COVID-19, there was still very little vaccine hesitancy. When the lockdowns took place, so that sort of like early 2020, mid 2020 period, um, doing house to house vaccination campaigns did cause a lot of concerns in Ethiopia. But that was a temporary thing which which soon passed. In, uh, in Cameroon, on the other hand, um, it looks like we still have a uh, a massive upswing in hesitancy to accept the polio vaccine for a broad range of reasons. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting in itself. Uh, I mean, I suppose maybe it's a bit obvious that um, in these two places on the different sides of the continent, this experience played out in totally different ways. Now, uh, I hoped the screen would be bigger. Uh, can anybody read this? Yeah? Well, you can, Ketan, but you've got the front wear receipt. So, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, okay. So, quite far towards the back, we can see it. Um, okay, because so this is actually, uh, this is quite a complicated slide. It has something like 120 data points displayed, displayed on it, but it does, uh, it is probably the most interesting thing that came out of the research. Okay, so here on this side, this is a list of um, when we did the focus groups, the reasons people raised spontaneously, so we didn't give them a list, they brought up all of these reasons for either why they were hesitant to take polio vaccines or uh, COVID vaccines, or why people they knew were hesitant to take polio vaccines or COVID vaccines. So that's what this list is, uh, the ones which are the biggest concerns at the top, the ones which are the lowest concerns are at the bottom. Um, the dark, so the, camera, the uh, orange part is uh, refers to Cameroon, the blue part refers to Ethiopia, and the uh, darkness of the colour shows uh, the number of focus groups in which this concern was raised. So it, it's taking quant out of qualitative work. So of course it's not representative. That's not uh, the point. That's not why we did this. We weren't trying to get numbers, but it does tell you something about how in these areas, at least among the people we spoke to, how broad these concerns, these concerns are. The column for the, on the left here, this refers to, uh, this is what people are concerned about with regard to OPV. This one uh, on the right is uh, about COVID vaccines and then the same Ethiopia, blah, blah, blah. And the green tick refers to beliefs that people had themselves. And the red tick refers to beliefs that people didn't have themselves, but which other people in, they thought other people in their community did have so um, the starkest conclusion here is that uh, in Ethiopia, especially for polio vaccine, basically people aren't worried about this in the, in the slightest. People have a very high level of trust in polio vaccine, much more concerns about COVID vaccines. Cameroon is a totally different story where you can see there's a high level of concern about OPV, so polio vaccines, and also a high level of concern about COVID vaccines. And um, the one is just to focus on OPV in Cameroon. The ones that seem to be the most concerning is people are scared of side effects, which, uh, OK, I mean, that's sort of very reasonable when it comes to vaccines in general. Um, fears of overdoses. Uh, uh, more than half of focus groups had participants who said that uh, religious leaders in their community were against uh, polio vaccines. <coughs> There are concerns that um, polio vaccine could be uh, could contain COVID-19 or could be a COVID vaccine in disguise. Uh, there are concerns for OPV. I mean, um, people who work on polio would have heard all of these different concerns before. Two minutes. Okay. Final. This is the uh, final slide. So. 
essentially I had finished that previous slide and that, that essentially describes what we found in the research, right? So there's just one more slide, which is about um, recommendations. And the reason I want to use this two minutes, I, I do want to make these points. Um, the first thing is that I think in this research and actually throughout all kinds of different research that we've done in polio SBC, one thing that w is very apparent is that quite often decisions about vaccination modalities are made from a technical level, actually quite a technocratic level of um, the kinds of people who work for UN agencies and the kind of people who are at high levels of government in different countries. Uh, these are the people who tend to make technical decisions about vaccine modalities. So things like vaccination schedules. Um, so in the case of Afghanistan, Pakistan, yeah, it's a bit better now, but we've obviously seen these relentless vaccination schedules where people are being asked to vaccinate their children many, many uh, times. Um, in Pakistan, I guess we see uh, a phenomena like um, if you remember when uh, we decided to use that gun to do IPV, IPV injections. Um, and in the case of Cameroon, we see uh, essentially what seems to have happened is that um, polio vaccination and COVID-19 vaccination has been done very close, very close together, right? Very close together in time. And I think um, this is kind of a main point I wanted to, I want to make through all of this is just to say that uh, we really need to speak to target communities to hear what they have to say about um, vaccination modalities before we make the decision to do them. And sometimes that happens. So for NOPV introduction, I think Katan, you raised that um, we decided not to communicate in Mozambique about the change in what vaccine we were using. And that actually partly comes out of a different piece of research that we did a couple of years ago, where prior to introducing this new version of OPV, we asked communities what they thought about it. And they basically said, well, maybe you shouldn't uh, tell everybody very much about it, right? Because it's very confusing. Uh, as I'm out of time, uh, I also wanted to say that qual research, uh, this is a very good way to get these kinds of insights in a fairly quick, fairly-ish inexpensive way. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Um, we're going to take some questions. I'm going to read out one from online. Uh, Richard Sharma, what's the root cause? Oh, this is for you, Jahan. What's the root cause? of the refusals of those five to 6,000 slum dweller families and what has been done so far to directly engage them. So let's do the same process as last time and any other people with questions? And yes, down the back, right next to Tommy with the mic. Hi, good afternoon. So this is Hadir, SBC officer from Iraq office. My question is for the old presenters. Have you done, hi doctor, have you done any uh, gender related, uh, let's say questions or, or data segregation? And if so, were there any significant information that were different uh, throughout, you know, the male and female results? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take another couple of questions if you've got them. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, yep. Should I ask and then I'll give it to Yeah, Yeah, question. please, yeah. Hi, hi um, Neetu from CDC. Um, really, really interesting set of presentations. Um, my question is for Ross. The the really interesting way to sort of quantify qual data, I think some qual purists would, <laughs> but I, I got a lot of insights out of that. Um, what is the, it about the context in Ethiopia, you know, versus Cameroon where, because there's there's a story behind that as well. Um, in terms of their perceptions towards OPV uh, and co COVID really not affecting perceptions of OPV, but w in Cameroon, it was clearly generalized concerns. So what from, you know, did you ask any questions about that or did you get any information about contextual factors? Thanks. Um, up the front here, Tommy. Please. Sorry, you'll have to wait for the mic and he's getting slower in his old age. Uh, the, this... Um, and Keithan and Ross, you jo both, uh, this is for both of you. So one of the things, we work with the religious leaders quite a bit, and then we are trying to uh, develop a module co-creating with the religious leaders. One of the concerns, or rather, you know, there's a difference of opinion among different people about how much should technical information should we really be giving to religious leaders? Because the idea is that they wanted to 
delve into a, a kind of details into what the vaccine is, mRNA, and you know how it works, what the vaccine is, and all that. So the balance between science and how much do you co communicate to communities has been one thing which we are really struggling with. So it is very interesting to hear from Ketan, but also Ross, you uh, in, um, you quoted that as uh, saying that you know you preferred giving only what is necessary. Did any of the religious leaders actually ask that they wanted more science-based content? What is your view in that? Because that is something which is going to be very important for us to understand as we move towards the global, uh, you know, uh, modules, which is going to be fairly ge general. Thank you. We'll take one more question if there is one. Uh, Jitendra. Yeah, I'm Jitendra from Core Group Polio Project India. Mm, I'm question for Ross. Ross, the, for polio and COVID, for polio and COVID, the target group for immunization is entirely different. For polio, we target under five children. For COVID, uh, initially we started with adult population, and in some countries now they started for school going children. So, in your study, was there any question or got any insight about how community or caregivers relate these? Uh, both vaccines, because this is completely different vaccine. So how they could relate their perceptions and uh, come up with this kind of a thing? Thank you. And just to the folks online, I realize there's a lot of questions online. We'll pass them on. But we did ask uh, Richan's one, Richan Sharma's one initially. So if I could ask you all to be uh, kind of succinct in your responses, that would be good. And we'll start with Jahan. And uh, lunch awaits us after this. Uh, thank you. Like uh, the question, root cause of refusals in slum areas, specifically if we talk about Kirachi, uh, mainly like the concern of those refusals are they believe that it's with Western conspiracy against us. Mostly these are Pashtuns living in those areas, and somehow they feel that it may create infertility in children as well. So linking the same question to the gender uh, specifically, it's good for girls that mostly uh, like uh, when we segregated the refusal data, it's around like 45% of them are girls and 55% of them are basically boys. And somehow they prefer to vaccinate their girl children because they believe that it can uh, create infertility in boys. So somehow girls are more getting more vaccination if compared with boys. Uh, but yes, the root, the main root cause of the refusals are mainly it's Western conspiracy and this is somehow further fueling uh, by uh, the non uh, facility, the non provision of basic facilities in those slum areas, and somehow they believe you are only coming for polio, not for other uh, other services. So uh, this is like mainly it's Western, Western conspiracy and Pashtuns, and in other areas, in in Urdu speaking and, and other, so, uh, they mainly uh, asking for other facilities. Thank you. The one on religious leaders, I think what um, he passed for us, we have a guide. I need to look into it in detail. We have a guide for religious leaders on all the care seeking practices that are promoted. And as far as I know, uh, for that guide, the information is is very minimal in terms of the science of, of transmission of the disease and you know, what to do for prevention. It's more about uh, promoting the practice and how they can use their um, influence in, in the community uh, to, to start promoting those behaviors as part of, uh, you know, the work that they do in the community, either in the religious place of worship or um, back into the community. For polio specifically, uh, this camp, the, some of the campaigns during this round uh, this year, there were sessions which were so the the in addition to door to door, uh, there were um, vaccinators or mobilizers who were also present outside the church uh, in some of the places where or churches where there were some refusals within that community. And again, it was a matter of getting the the church lead or the religious leaders to talk about it during the religious uh, services by saying that there is a disease it's in the community. Most people are getting vaccinated. So again, not too much detail in terms of the science, but we can review the manual and I'll share it with you. Yeah, OK. Um, so on uh, on the question about gender, um, we actually did do this, uh, this piece of. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Unless she just unless she just stormed out. <laughs> no, I'm sure she'll be back. I'm sure she'll be back. Um, so uh, to do the gender question first, um, uh, we did do this study in a gender disaggregated way. There is actually a very strong push within the GPEI app, the app of so the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, to um, uh, strengthen our work on uh, on gender. And um, essentially, what we found in this particular study is there were extremely few differences between the perceptions of men of men and women in uh, in both countries. And now I don't know why exactly that is, but the you know we did eight focus or whatever it was, yeah eight focus groups of men, eight focus groups of women. So the kind of the usual the usual way. And in the end, the um, uh, we didn't have a huge amount to write about, except that people basically thought the same, like sort of between between genders. Um, I mean, sometimes it is like that, I suppose. Um, on um, uh, on the question about uh, religious about religious leaders, uh, I mean, the answer is, I mean, it really it's really hard to give a global answer on that kind of question, right? I mean, it's super, super contextual. My, because um, <clears throat> I spent four years doing sort of um, political research in Afghanistan before I came to UNICEF, my head jumps to religious leaders in Afghanistan. And the minute you know the first thing about that, it's like, wow, man, this is a, this is, is it's a very complicated, uh, thing and it requires an approach which is suited to the context of Afghanistan in that example and sort of put more broadly I don't know like I don't know if I could if I could say right it's for colleagues in those countries to to try to get to grips with that complex phenomenon and it probably just depends on the individual situation I'm sure that's old news to you right um um on uh, how the communities uh, related the two vaccines, despite the fact that one is for adults, one is for children. I find this absolutely fascinating, right? Um, I think there is definitely this tendency for us as, um, as practitioners, particularly in the immunization space, to to assume that other people have a like communities or the general public have a strong idea about oh this is a polio vaccine this is a covid vaccine this is a measles vaccine this is oh this is i'm on my penta my penta one <laughs> like those two or whatever i think the reality is that people just conflate all vaccinations I mean, maybe COVID is a slightly de different thing because it was su it's new. It's been such a big emergency. The media portrayal has, has been as a state of exception. But I mean, certainly what we found in in uh, in this research and to some extent in previous research that we've done in sort of DRC, Nigeria, Kenya, is that people sort of think about them all as they think about vaccination. In general, and I, I think that's really what's happened with with polio vaccines in Cameroon is that actually people have been so uh, subjected to misinformation about uh, the COVID nineteen vaccines that they have just applied that to to polio vaccines as well. Um, on uh, the difference between um, Ethiopia and Cameroon and why they would be different from one another. Who asked that question? There, yeah. Um, uh, Soterin, um, do you think that you'd be able to say something about, about, about refusals in Cameroon? Look, I can speak about Ethiopia. Uh, in, can, we actually, can, we, can we pass a mic to Soterin? Is that okay? If that's okay with you, Sotarin, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but look, I mean, in, I can say something about Ethiopia. Um, I think basically it looks, my take on it, not being an Ethiopia expert, is that um, uh, there is simply not very much anti-vaccination sentiment in Ethiopia, uh, and that continued. Uh, now, Cameroon is a totally different case, and, and, and Sotarin works on this all the time and is Cameroonian, right? So. 
Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Soterin Tianga. I'm working, I'm SBC specialist, uh, polio uh, headquarter team, but I'm based in Geneva with the outbreak response team. Um, thank you, Ross, <laughs> to giving me the flow. Uh, for Cameroon, I think that with the research, we had many information concerning uh, the causes of the refusal cases. But what I could add is that uh, we have many reasons. We have political reasons uh, linked with the fact that we have uh, in our state uh, a president who people uh, didn't want uh, uh, to, to continue to see him, and uh, people for certain reason refuse to vaccinate children because this uh, political situation, we have another situation linked with social and econ economical situation. People would like to have more money, uh, to have uh, the possibility to reach more better health centers, and for them, uh, the vaccination of polio with uh, the lot of vaccine the campaign that we had in the country before, it is not their priority for now. We have another reason link with, uh, as you said, misinformation links with uh, COVID-19. Uh, before, um, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we recorded a lot of refusal, but it was different. After the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we had more uh, uh, refusal cases linked with the fact that people doesn't want to be vaccinated and for them it was uh, this um, it was uh, uh, the it was like uh, the health uh, personnel want to vaccinate children without their uh, their own um, needs so it was uh, the reason that people uh, 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 think that it was COVID-19 and not polio vaccine. And I think that for now, with this research and the, the research that we conducted in the country, I think six or one year before, uh, the country office with national part started to, to work on uh, a SBC plan to see how to address this misunderstanding uh, of the two vaccines because it is not the same, but for them it was uh, the disguised form of uh, uh, vaccination of COVID-19 for the children. Even if we have messages where we say that it is not the same vaccine, so I think we need to continue to, to work with the communities, with re religious leaders, to make sure that uh, communities understand well that it is not uh, 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 the COVID-19 vaccine, but polio vaccine for children, and that uh, it is also different. Thank you. Thanks, Sudu. Okay, um, I come from a cricketing background, and there's been an appeal here for one more question. And then I wondered if, Dr. Mozem, you had any final thoughts before we all went for lunch. So I'll invite you, but let's go for one more question and then, and then Dr. Mozem, and then we will close for lunch. Tommy, give her the mic. No funny stuff. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, just it's not a question, actually. It's a response to what Deepa was asking in terms of the misinformation. So my name is Surani, and I'm with the immunization demand team in headquarters. Uh, I think, you know, in the context of this whole misinformation uh, you know, area and looking at the amount of questions that keep coming up, probably even for the religious leaders, it might be what is being asked, you know, looking at if the science is what is being questioned and if the science is what is being reflected in the concerns coming from the community, then I suppose the degree of response needs to be in that context. So because in some countries, what we noticed was there was a lot of questions on this mRNA thing. You know, and unless you address that and give them the right information on that, you are just, uh, you know, putting an eye patch over an issue. So I think it would be very contextual where we really need to see what the issue is. If the issue is very superficial and religious leaders are just saying, oh, we don't want it or we are not vaccinating because of other concerns, then it's a different thing. But if the science is what is being questioned, then that is that needs to be the answer. 
Hey, thank you. And Dr. Moser, any, any final thoughts before we close for lunch? Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I'm first comment is I'm so happy to see the house full because we started with 27, correct? So that's, that's <laughs> so, uh, exactly. Uh, but not, now it's both, now it's both. Yes, and that's my question is the quantitative versus the qualitative. Ross and I am on the same team, but I think we meet outside more due to, due to COVID than we meet in the office. So I have a question to Ross is that you said it's pretty, very good timing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you said in a very short time it was done and the tool, how standardized the tool is, because that's, I see, we have another hat, me and uh, uh, Ross, that we are part of the m and team as well. And it's very difficult to standardize the qualitative research when we try to make some generalized. So I wanted to know how standardized these tools are to tell the world and how fast a country team can do when they decide to do a study and how quickly they can finish. Thank you. <laughs> We're listening in on your team. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Marzen, for the easy, the easy questions. Uh, very complicated answer in one minute. Yeah. Uh, Marzen's my boss's boss, so I better do a good job. Um, yeah, look, uh, there's different ways of doing it. Um, as I said, this one, we went for uh, quite a high quality approach, I would say. So, you know, we outsourced to a group of experts. I mean, FHI, I mean, all of these guys have PhDs, right? We outsourced the tool design to them because they know what they're, they know what they're doing. Now, um, that's great, but uh, that's not standardized. We did the same, basically the same, more or less the same tools in Cameroon and Ethiopia, but that's like a bespoke solution. Um, I do think there is a lot of call for doing these things in a quicker way, because I mean, that study from uh, just for anyone who doesn't work in UNICEF, contracting is a, takes forever, right? It takes months. So like uh, in a lot of circumstances, particularly outbreak response, if you do that high quality bespoke way, by the time you've done the research and got the results, the outbreak is over. So there's no point in, there's no point in doing it. Now, um, that's not to say that there's not a place for this kind of research, there, there really is. Uh, you can also do, I mean, a lot of people in this room will know, you can also do this kind of research in a much quicker way. And if you have the right, if you happen to have the people in your team with the right, with the right skills, you can do a really good job as well. And uh, for that, we actually have uh, developed um, in, in our team, we have something called the Rapid Social Data Collection Tools for Polio Outbreak Response. And that is a, a document which we put together, which has a description of how you should go about doing this kind of quick qualitative research uh, without outsourcing it to somebody else. And it also has several data collection tools that people can essentially copy and paste from. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, folks. Um, we're going to break for lunch now. Tommy, can you brief us on the arrangements? I'll stress the word light, uh, not the word lunch. Uh, <laughs> and you won't be thirsty. There's lots to drink. So, uh, But it's right outside. There's some little things. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed in what I saw. It, but So just, uh, just to warn you that it's not, I wouldn't call it necessarily a lunch, but I hope you still come back. <laughs>
I will. If I can invite us to reconvene, that would be excellent. Thank you. And uh, could Adnan, uh, Deepa, Julianne, and Aman please come up to the top here? Thank you. Hi. Is there anyone outside still or? Please. Me. Okay, folks. Uh, one session. So Adnan, Deepa, Julianne, and Aman. Getting lost. Deepa's lost? Sure. Okay. But do you want a seat up here now? Will we get you a chair? Yeah. We don't want any organizational issues. OK, welcome back, folks. Thanks to UNICEF for lunch. Much appreciated. And the drinks, etc. And so I think the the Oxford English Dictionary have a, what is it, a word of the year they normally do? And misinformation must have been up there somewhere <laughs> really high because everyone's talking about misinformation. And it's obviously a clear challenge, not just for polio, but for every field of work. And the difference between misinformation and disinformation, of course, points you in different directions. So we're glad to have a panel of folks that are here and can talk about their efforts on misinformation. And I've forgotten who's going to go first. Adnan, you're up first. Adnan, thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is the most challenging time to have a presentation <laughs> so <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so i am uh, adnan shazad i work with the polio team in new york uh, headquarters and uh, i've been working with unicef for 6 months now and uh, we will be talking about is my presentation set loaded no, this is not my. This is Ross. This is Ross's. Yeah. Oh, I can do it again. It didn't have enough time. Next slide, hopefully. I am clicking. We should, we should appoint this. Let me see. No. So where do you find it? Yeah, point it. Yeah. But they have got a presentation. No, I think they've got to upload it. Uh, but is that 
Ross, are you presenting again? Sorry, is, is someone? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's it. OK, great. Cool. So uh, this is our presentation. So uh, we have uh, kept it very simple according to the format. Firstly, we will talk about what we are working on, uh, and then we will talk about our learnings and uh, we'll end up with uh, the recommendations. So um, at uh, uh, like, uh, let me quickly tell you how it started. So we we were working on our polio campaigns when the, um, the COVID uh, stuck, and we had to stop all the, uh, the all the vaccination campaigns due to COVID. And when we started again, there there was a lot of misinformation going on uh, with the. COVID vaccines and uh, we uh, our polio workers uh, were having the similar issues as the, the COVID uh, vaccinators uh, were having. So people were mixing uh, all the in misinformation. So we started tracking uh, the misinfo misinformation regarding polio and then we set up uh, this uh, function at our uh, uh, UNICEF uh, New York headquarters. So what we do actually, uh, uh, I, I won't go into the details, but there are two major functions that we perform. Uh, one is broadly speaking, digital engagement, and the second is the misinformation management. So uh, under di digital engagement, what we do is uh, there is a startup that we have formed uh, in uh, par partnership with uh, PGP, that is called Digital Communication, uh, Digital Community Engagement Unit, or DCEU. So DCEU is um, an initiative that we piloted in uh, five countries, and now it, we are reaching out more than 38 uh, countries uh, with that. What we do in DCEU. Um, are the four basic things that we do under DCU. One is online social listening. So we do social listening. We uh, uh, we, we use uh, different tools to see what's going on in the social media landscape, what people are talking about, and uh, what are the rumors, what is the misinformation going on around the polio vaccination. And we take out the top rumors, top misinformation, and the, uh, and we uh, relay it through newsletters. And once we pick up the top misinformation or the top rumors, we develop some messaging and content around that uh, misinformation. For example, like uh, th there are there, there is an um, uh, there is a rumor like vaccination is not halal or vaccination causes infertility. We will pick up that rumor. We will design, we will see like in what areas this uh, uh, rumor is spreading, what are the demographic, what are the communities that are having that, that problem. Then we will develop some messaging and content around to address that misinformation. So that is the second pillar of DCEU. Like first is th the social listening, and second is developing content and messages uh, based on that those social listening results, and then we develop some responses and help countries with message uh, distribution. So uh, we have uh, we have some message banks like uh, the, those are the live, um, I would say, repositories in which we track the misinformation. We develop some standard responses. They, they are like they are not to like, like the final responses, but they are very uh, ready to be deployed. We get approval from WHO. We, we work on the mis, uh, the uh, responses and they are like uh, we circulate it around and uh, countries have access to that whenever they see some misinformation. And we have also defined the level of misinformation, like at what level, which 
response you deploy, like if it is uh, um, uh, a pre-bunking, a debunking of misinformation. So we have div divided uh, our message banks according to the um, severity or the threat level of the misinformation. And the uh, other thing that we are working under DCEU is the digital social mobilization. So that is uh, uh, a digital version of uh, social mobilization that you all guys do. So what the concept is, instead of uh, like we getting out with some standard messaging or like uh, debunking the uh, rumors or misinformation, we have started a volunteer program in which uh, uh, people from within the communities join us and they are like uh, some kind of influencers in the digital space and then they they volunteer uh, to join our call cause uh, currently uh, we have uh, more than 25000 uh, uh, volunteers joined our program that program is called you influencer so we uh, we deal with those you influencers so for example, if there is a community in which we are seeing uh, an ongoing misinformation or ongoing trend, we would uh, see like how many you influencers we have in that particular area. Uh, if we are doing any campaign, we would ask them like this. This is the rumor. This is the misinformation we are dealing with. This is the right message that we want to get out. And then we collaborate with those uh, you influencers or digital social mobilizers to get our message out. And uh, on top of all these things, there is an ongoing impact assessment we keep seeing because this is this is kind of um, all kind of new things that we are implementing. So there is an ongoing impact assessment like what is working, what isn't working, and uh, then we keep uh, optimizing it. So that is one part. And the second part is misinformation management so, uh, workshops. So in which uh, in this section, we um, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, conducted more than uh, I think 20 uh, workshops in different countries. Um, uh, the focus of those workshop is uh, capacity building. So uh, they are uh, designed for the uh, SBC staff who are working already in the uh, field, but uh, we teach them how to um, uh, monitor the social media. We provide them with the tools. Uh, we provide them with the technical support. So uh, we set up dashboard for them. We uh, give them the uh, tools for like uh, standard uh, messaging uh, uh, tools, and we also teach them or help them how to set up the task forces at their uh, country level and also to uh, transfer that skill to, to frontline worker level. So the, these are the two uh, major things that we are doing. Again, uh, we can go into details of any of these uh, uh, if you want to, but uh, uh, let's go to uh, what we have learned from this. So the first one is uh, first learning is like misinformation is natural. Like uh, although um, we have started listening a lot about misinformation management nowadays, but it uh, it is here for forever. Like um, the only thing that has changed is uh, the use of digital media. Like the um, the pace as, at which the misinformation spreads is exponential, but misinformation was there, and we have been dealing with it forever. And right now, our uh, goal is not to eradicate it. Like it it will be there, uh, it was there, but all we need is capacity to manage it, uh, to manage it in a way that we minimize the harm of it so uh, so so our learning basically is we are not here to eradicate the misinformation we need the uh, tools and uh, we need the mechanism in which we are uh, not only um, tracking the misinformation but ready to counter it with the right information or create an environment where there is enough 
right information so that we are ready to deal with the misinformation when it arises. So uh, and 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 the thing is like uh, when there is information, there will be misinformation. It is not like. This information could be. Um, intentional, but misinformation. Could be just because you are concerned about uh, a thing you want to know more. There, there could be right information. There could be wrong information. You, if you are talking about it, there will be misinformation. So, for example, uh, in the um, uh, we have analyzed like almost more than two million social media posts regarding uh, polio, and out of which, like eighty percent of uh, those posts were somehow uh, ha had some misinformation in that. So and and further analysis shows like not all of it was intentional or like bad thing like but but when people start talking about it, the misinformation um, um, is generated. So uh, again, the first learning is it will happen. There is no eradication. We need to manage it and uh, manage it with proper tools and technologies. The second thing is. Uh, the the learning that I would uh, say here, like digital is not optional. So this is again something that uh, we we know, like 63% of the world population is online. And uh, uh, but when we say like 63% is online, does this mean the remaining population is not impacted by digital media. That's not true. So even even in the remotest of areas where they have no, um, as Ross was saying in his presentation, like uh, 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 he thought like uh, they won't be using uh, smartphones or digital in their uh, campaign, but they were wrong. So even in the remotest of the areas where there are uh, like uh, traditional uh, opinion leaders or uh, traditional uh, uh, ways of communication, digital media still impacts their opinion and all the information that especially um, in this age, all the global misinformation travels through digital media and you have to use digital media for your SPC um, messaging. So uh, so what uh, so what we have seen and like uh, uh, in my work here, like less than whenever we do design SBC campaign, we we allocate very minimum budgets to digital media. So that is what like even if we talk in terms of percentages, like this community has just five percent um, um, digital penetration or internet access. Are we allocating 5% of our SBC budget to digital media? No, so we we, we just need to uh, and and uh, the thing is digital media as compared to um, traditional media is very granular, is very targeted and uh, um, as uh, we were talking earlier is very cost effective like we can we can in other forms of uh, traditional media we cannot say like what we have spent and what is the roi how many people we have reached how many people have acted on what but in digital media we can calculate roi of each and every penny that we have spent on digital media these are the uh, communities that we were targeting these are the people who have seen our messages these are the people who have taken an action on that message they these are the clicks they have done and these are the pages they have visited after clicking on our ads or whatever we are so uh, what uh, i'm suggesting here is we should be integrating digital into our spc uh, messaging and thirdly uh what we have learned is uh, again this this came out of our um, uh, trainings that we have conducted uh, imahan can tell us like uh, we 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 did uh, we are doing 
really good trainings and uh, uh, in the trainings, everyone is on board. Like we will do this. We uh, we we get to know. We bring people together. We we start working on it. When but then it it, it fades away because people have to do so many things. They are like uh, for us, like when we are working on polio, uh, 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 we our focus is that like um, uh, we uh, have to um, uh, we have to uh, focus on polio. We have to uh, do social listening for polio. We have to come up with the misinformation management for polio. But in reality, those those are the people who are uh, uh, doing several other things they are uh, dealing with polio ebola cholera so what we are trying to do from now onwards is making a more like uh, collaborative thing where we are not only social listening for polio related uh, misinformation but a more uh, integrated approach with routine immunization so that uh, we are listening to all other things and coming up with the uh, with a more integrated strategy yeah so the last slide is the recommendations so what uh, we are going to recommend is uh, that uh, uh, all the country offices should have a task force um, uh, and what are the task force uh, task force are the people from different th these are these are not uh, this is not a new thing that we are suggesting. Like we are not asking people to um, recruit someone or make new things. So if you have already a crisis management committee or uh, um, um, crisis communication task force, we want them to be involved in misinformation management so that everyone has a clear role. Uh, and uh, we we encourage that the people are from all the GPI partners like WHO, uh, um, UNICEF, of course, and the uh, Ministry of Health, so that whenever there is a crisis, there is a misinformation management uh, issue, everyone knows what is their role, like uh, instead of like uh, just panicking. So we are meeting on regular basis. We are analyzing the social listening results. This, these are the trends coming up. These are the top uh, stories going in our area regarding vaccination. And if something comes up, who is go uh, going to do what? And secondly, um, uh, include digital engagement in every SBC plan. So uh, again, I have talked about it earlier, like digital uh, engagement is most cost effective and uh, messaging can be tailored to local context and audience up to a very granular level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. And, and um, so Deeper and Surangani, but Deeper's not here, is that right? So, oh, Deeper. I thought you. Oh, I thought you said you weren't here. All right, Deeper and Surangani. So, I'll, because I don't need the presentation uh, until it comes, actually. Um, Surani will take us through the presentation, but I wanted to give a little bit of overview on what we are doing as UNICEF Demand for Immunization Team. So, my name is Deepa Pokhrel. So, for most of you, I know, but I am the Senior Advisor for Social and Behavior Change and the Team Lead for Vaccine Demand in New York headquarters. So um, just as a context, in 2019, WHO declared uh, that vaccine hesitancy was one of the top 10 public health um, threats. Uh, so based on that, you know, uh, of course, uh, it created a lot of buzz. But vaccine hesitancy, as we know, is very contextual. You cannot say that what you are seeing in India is going to be the same in even Nepal, which is a neighbor. So it's very different from country to country. In that context, we have actually taken social listening as our flagship initiative in UNICEF. And when we talk about uh, social listening, we're not talking about social media monitoring only. So for us, social listening is much beyond just the digital communication or tracking what the rumors or misinformation, given that in the past two years, the misinformation really soared up. And it was not just the social media. Social media obviously had a big hand in it, but we also know that there was a lot of 
offline conversation, whether it was through media or WhatsApp group among religious leaders, your friends, communities, because there was a lot happening around it. So when we think about social listening, it's beyond infodemic, which a lot of time you would hear out of your colleagues talking about it. Infodemic, yes. Social media, yes, but plus, 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 because I think one of the strengths that we have as an organization is the community feedback mechanism. So what we are trying to do is really to look at misinformation, disinformation in a holistic way. What is going on in social media? Also, what are the conversations which are going on offline through radio or television, or it could be community feedback mechanism, as I said, and how do you make sense of it so that we are able to respond on real time as quickly as possible and support countries on capacity building again to emphasize not just on digital communication. So it's beyond digital communication that we are looking at. We have set up uh, different partnerships like with the, we work very closely with Yale uh, Institute of uh, Public Health and Public Goods Project, as well as uh, with 